associated with your thoughts. Yo, yo, yo. What's up, my people? It's Ace Mar Tamuz. Today, I'm going to be reading one chapter of this book. The goal is to get to the goal is to read one chapter without my camera dying so I'm gonna be quick with this one and also not like messing up so let's get right into it chapter 1 any background noise y'all hear just ignore it alright so the book we reading is titled the 12 Universal Laws of Success by Dr. Herbert, Herbert Harris. Chapter one, the law of thought. The first universal law of success is the universal law of thought and manifestation. Thoughts become the results in accord with the nature and feeling of the thought. More personally, your thoughts manifest in your life experience in accord with the emotions and feelings you associate with your thoughts. One of the simplest statements of the universal law of thought is, for as they thinketh in their heart, so are they. To think in their heart means how they really feel. To think in their heart is how they really feel inside about those particular thoughts. Which emotions and feelings are associated with them. A further illumination of in their hearts is given in Matthew 6.21. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Your heart is the center of your true feelings and emotions. It is always focused on the things that are important to you, your value system, and how you feel about yourself. For example, if you have the thought that financial independence is one of your primary objectives in life, then financial independence should begin to manifest in your life over a reasonable period of time. If it does not, then look into your inner feelings. Inside, you may feel, for whatever reasons, that you are not worthy of financial independence. If you do not feel in your heart, in your basic feeling nature about yourself, that you deserve the things, conditions, or circumstances that you describe in your, in your thoughts, then they will not happen for you. They will not manifest in your life experience. The essence of universal law of thought and manifestation is that a thought has two basic aspects. One, a rational aspect, the statement of the thought itself, the idea, the words. To an emotional aspect, the personal feelings about the personal feelings and emotions associated with the thought. What you recognize in your thinking, you energize in your feelings and emotions. What you energize in your feelings and emotions, you realize in your life experience. Three primary areas, areas are covered by the universal law of thought and manifestation. Thoughts you have about yourself. Thoughts you have about yourself. Your self-image. Thoughts you have about others. Your attitude. Thoughts you have about the world in general. Your world perspective. Your outlook on life. Your frame of reference reference in this section 
we will deal with the self-image only, the other areas, attitude and outlook, will be dealt with under the chapter on the universal law of human magnetism. Self-image, how you see yourself in your own eyes determines what you get out of life. Self-image is your own conception of yourself. It is the mental and emotional picture you hold in your own consciousness of who you are, what you are about, and what you represent. Your self-image is important because it is the starting point of your life experiences. The image you hold of yourself is like a great vase into which all your life experiences are poured and blended. If your self-image is a small, limited conception of yourself based on ignorance, fear, doubt, and insecurity, then all of your experiences will be filter filtered through these same negative emotions. On the other hand, if your self-image is based on knowledge, love, courage, respect, faith, and confidence, confidence, your life experiences will be filtered. Through the same positive emotions. Self-image determines your capacity to give, receive, and interact with the life experiences and possibilities that confront you. <clears throat> I'm tripping. Let's go again. Self-image determines your capacity to give, receive, and and interact with the life experiences and possibilities that conf confront you. Your self-image is like a magnet, attracting or repelling like or unlike qualities into your life experience. You attract thoughts, people, and experiences which are congruent with how you think and feel about yourself. If you want to attract to if you want to attract the good health, wealth and happiness that you desire and dream about dream about, then you must develop a self image that is that is compatible. Let's pick it up where we where we left off at. You attract thoughts, people and experiences which are congruent with how you think and feel about yourself. If you want to attract the good health, wealth, and happiness that you desire and dream about, then you must develop a self-image that is compatible with and supports these very thoughts, namely good health, wealth, and happiness. A nice example of how the self-image works is this. One question that appears on just about every job application is, what salary and benefits are you expecting to receive? Many prospective employers give a lot of weight to how this question is answered. Subconsciously, most people would answer with a figure that indicates their own assessment of what they bring to the position. A figure below what the position is worth is often a tip-off that the applicant has a low assessment of their own skills and would probably not be a good employee. Employee. A, fi a figure too high above what the position is worth might indicate a lack of knowledge about the position itself. If you've done your homework and know the deal, 
you should be able to set a figure at the high end of what the position is worth, plus just enough fluff to get some attention. However, let me warn you, be, prepa be prepared to answer the question that will surely come. Why do you feel that you would be worth two zillion dollars to this company? Have a well-researched, well-thought-out, well-presented, logical, and intellig intelligent reply. You will probably get the position on your terms, consistent with your self-image. Things which affect your self-image. The most important aspects of the self-image are generally developed in the first stage of life. Once this self-image is fully established, all subsequent stages are built on. That was my stomach. I'm fasting. We're gonna get back to the reading though. Once, once this self-image is fully established, all subsequent stages are built on and filtered through it. In fact, all changes in in life begin with your self-image and take place through changes in the feelings, emotions, and attitudes attitudes that it represents. The three main things that affect your self-image are thoughts, emotions, and feelings develop in the education stage of your life, particularly, particularly your early childhood, conception through age seven. Two, environment. Three, associations. Thoughts, emotions, and feelings. In the first seven years of life, children, children develop the basic system of values that will take them through life. It is during this period that the child learns and develops emotions and feelings of fear and reward, pain and pleasure love and lack of love, guilt, blame, and shame, praise and discouragement, curiosity of or lack of interest, persistence or discouragement, respect or disdain, manners or crudeness, courtesy or callousness, and other positive or negative emotions and feelings. sounds this is what it's like when you live close to the city I think I need to be out there in the country or something where it's peaceful but back to it young children are sponges for thoughts emotions and feelings they thrive and blossom on good teaching good thoughts good feelings and positive emotions yet they have no defense against bad teaching, bad thoughts, negative feelings, and negative emotions. At this young age, a child's ability to discern and discriminate the good from the negative has not yet fully developed. Whatever thoughts, teachings, or experiences that, experiences that young children are exposed to go straight into their subconscious and conscious minds. They make a permanent impact upon a child's emotional and feeling uh, feeling nature. This is the this is the crucible in which a child's personal value system is molded. Unfortunately, unfortunately, a young child has virtually no defense or options in this education experience. But it is on the emotional and feeling foundation that the rest of the of your life is built. Give thanks if it give thanks if it is was a good and positive foundation. Get busy if it wasn't. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Proverbs twenty two six 
it is these feelings and emotions that become associated with your thoughts. Unless they are changed in later years, these feelings and emotions develop as a child, guide, and to a large extent, determine your life experiences. Environment. Your environment is a strong influence upon your self-image because it is a source of validation and confirmation. Suppose you have a poor self-image and you live and work in a rundown area in a poorly maintained home in an, in an otherwise negative environment. What does that negative environment do other than confirm your negative self-image? When you are exposed to a particular, a particular environment, if you remain in it for a period of time, you take on some, you take on some of the characteristics and properties of the environment. If your self-image contradicts and conflicts with the characteristics and properties of your environment, you are confronted with three choices. One, change the environment. Two, change your self-image. Three, leave the environment. Associations. Association brings about assimilation. John Lavater, a noted Swiss theo theologian, beautifully captured this thought saying, frequent Frequent intercourse and intimate connection between two persons make them so alike that not, not only their dispositions are molded like each other, but their faces and tones of voice contract a similarity. You should primarily associate only with those persons who possess the traits and characteristics, characteristics that complement the positive aspects of your self-image. Ooh. I like what I just read because it's, this is the, the art of talking about like uh, soul ties and you got to be careful with who you be intimate with. Can't open yourself up to everyone. So I like what I just read. But let's continue. Such positive associations will greatly enhance your own development and help confirm and establish the vision, emotions, and feelings you have about yourself. Five signals of a poor self-image. In doing your own personal analysis, chill out, bro. I'm not going to eat no food. I'm fasting. Mind over body. That's how you got to be sometimes. Uh, before I was rudely interrupted by my stomach, I left off at, in doing your, in doing your own personal analysis of your self-image, there are certain keys or signals to look for. One, putting the blame on someone else. By putting the blame for your own circumstances and situation on someone else, you, you avoid taking responsibility for what you have really done to yourself. If you do not take responsibility for your, your condition, you cannot change it, nor can you grow through it. That which you cannot grow through, grow through. You will, grow, you will go through again and again. I'm going to read that once more. That which you cannot grow through, you will go through again and again. Two, running away from your problems. When you are confronted with a problem, problem or challenge, how do you respond? Generally, you can do one of four things. Flee it, fight it, forget it, or face it. It is only when you face your problems and challenges and consider them projects to be completed that you grow stronger in faith 
and self-confidence. As your faith and confidence grows, your ability to handle greater problems and challenges improves. 3. Criticizing other people constantly. Why do you criticize other people constantly? Is your criticism constructive and motivate, no, motivated by true care, concern, and desire to help? Or is it based on envy, jealousy, and thoughts of inferiority? If your criticism is not positive, based on love, respect, and sincere desire to help and improve another person, then it is not constructive criticism and it does harm not only to the person to the other person but also to your own own self-image for waiting for someone else waiting for someone else to solve your problems slash challenges when you wait for someone else to solve your problems and challenges you neutralize your own possibilities for learning and growing through experience experience what keeps you from taking action when a problem problem, or challenge presents itself? Is it fear of failure that you won't do the right things? Or is it fear of success that contradicts how you really feel about yourself? Whether it is the fear of failure or fear of success, it doesn't matter since the result is the same. Procrastination, inaction, and ultimately, Failure. Pre five. Pretending, pretending that everything is okay. When you pretend that everything is all right, actively ignoring your problems and challenges, you subconsciously accept the consequences that will surely result from your inaction. You deceive yourself into thinking that there is no need for change or improvement and develop a false sense of complacency you eliminate virtually all possibility for personal growth and development the nature of problems and challenges is that if they continue to unresolve they only get worse problem problems versus projects a first step in developing a self-image that works effectively in attaining your goals is to analyze your present and past experiences. Were you generally successful or did, or did you give up and fail? How did, how did you handle your successes and fa your failures? What did you do when you confronted with serious problems? Do you continue going through the same problems again and again? Do you learn the lesson and move on? Let's look at your terminology. The word problem, as generally understood, has a very negative connotation, implying impassable objects, impossible people, adversity, and hardship. Calling something a problem, problem creates tension, strain, and a fear that there may be no solution. using the term project to describe anything that you would normally call a problem suggests a positive endeavor 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 of thoughts feelings and actions resulting in a particular desired outcome in short problems resulting in a particular desired outcome i just read that in short, problems may or may not be re be solved, while projects are generally completed. One has a far better attitude and frame of mind undertaking a project rather than solving a problem. Using the word challenge instead of a using the word challenge instead of problem also gives a more positive spin to an impending confrontation. When you face a challenge, it creates a positive aura of calling together your troops and powers to meet a worthy opponent. Alright y'all.
I decided that I'm gonna stop right there. It's too much noise going on. My belly, my belly is tripping. Also, uh, I appreciate everybody, everyone for tuning in. Drop a like, subscribe, and turn on post notifications so you'll be notified whenever I post. And as I always say, peace.